Good morning, Daniel. Good morning. How are you doing today? I'm doing well. How are you? Good. So what's your initial thoughts from WWDC this year? Oh boy, initial thoughts from WWDC were as most of us at the moment of the keynote, just like mental overload. How can I process all of these things happening? I think a lot of us agree it was just a monumental keynote, so much stuff packed into a single, you know, scant, whatever, what was it, two hours? Yes. Yeah, it was a lot of stuff. My initial reaction was, to be honest, maybe a little bit more like, mm, you know, the old uh, reality distortion field thing. I really came out of it thinking, wow, this is an all new world we're in now. AppKit is dead. UIKit is dead. <laughs> Swift UI <laughs> is the future. We're all Swift UI developers now. And that was my first reaction. And then I sort of slowly, gradually came to terms with the reality, although I still think Swift UI is the future for Apple. And I'm really impressed with what they've done with it. I really, I'm excited to see where it goes. I think like a lot of people, as we started to dig into it a little bit, it was like, oh yeah, there's still so much we can't do yet. There's still many things to iron out. Documentation isn't completely there. Yeah, right. And I mean, there's just some things that, you know, uh, people come up with and say like, wait, wait a minute, how do you do this? And then if you're lucky, somebody from Apple would respond on Twitter or something and just say, yeah, that's, um, we're working on that, you know, so it's, <laughs> it, it's kind of the level. Our sponsor this week is Bright Digit. Bright Digit is my company and we specialize in helping businesses build apps for the iPhone, the iPad, the Apple Watch and the Mac. I've been building apps for iOS for almost 10 years now. We have an opening for new projects. If you are a company who might already have developers but need help building something for any of the Apple platforms, send me an email and let's see what Bright Digit can do for you. Contact me personally at leo at brightdigit.com. That's L-E-O at brightdigit.com. And let's see how I can help you and your business. It's definitely felt like the biggest year since Swift came out, but I agree with you completely. I think. I would not recommend somebody to rewrite their whole app, obviously, in Swift UI, and nor would I necessarily recommend someone to switch their app to Swift UI if it's going to be out in the next six months. I think, like you said, it's a big long term change that's going to take a few years. Like, even with Swift, I think now, maybe in the last year, I think Swift is definitely ready for anybody to like jump in and start transitioning their code over slowly. But yeah, Swift UI is definitely not ready for anything to be released soon. Right. In retrospect, it's really lucky that we've had five years for Swift to settle in. Like imagine if Swift UI had been sort of, you know, developed in parallel with Swift and then all of a sudden it was like, here's a new language and here's a new framework to go with it. Right. That would have actually hampered the adoption of Swift probably. I also like how with Swift UI, the like interoperability with UI kit mm -hmm. is pretty healthy. It's like they totally understand that Swift UI is incomplete and you can always use UI kit with Swift UI and vice versa. They work together. Right. Yeah. I thought that was very thoughtful. I mean, it's pragmatic. And I mean, there's a lot of pragmatism coming out of that keynote. Like I said, it was a sort of all new world. But then also, you know, they did end up releasing what we had known as Marzipan, now called Catalyst. Right. So that was another example of a pragmatism where it's like, hey, look, we know you've got apps out there. We know a lot of you would like to adapt them to the Mac. Here's one way. Yes. And then also here's this all new way. Exactly. Before we get into your opinion on how Apple has changed, maybe go ahead and introduce yourself to those who don't know who you are. Oh, sure. Uh, yeah, my name is Daniel Jalkett, and I am founder and sole proprietor of Red Sweater Software for about the past... 15, oh, now it's actually more like 17 years, I've been working on my own. I, before that, worked for several years, about seven years for Apple. So I started out real young. My first job at Apple was testing System 7.5. Wow. Went on to be an engineer on the classic Mac OS system updates team. Then I transitioned over to Mac OS 10, you know, just before 10.0 was released. Worked there through 10.2, and then I just had a whim, sort of. I just wanted to change pace, so I actually ended up leaving Apple. And then the next 17 years has been this sort of, um, you know, figuring out my path. I started doing consulting. I ended up, 12 years ago, acquiring the main app I develop now, which is Mars Edit, a blog editor for the Mac. 
So I've been sort of moving that app forward while I work on some other stuff. And I'm also, you know, separately from my work as a developer, I'm also just sort of part of the developer community all this time. So I've gotten to know a lot of people and first in the Mac community, then in the iOS community, you know, occasionally against my instincts, <laughs> I force myself to go speak at conferences and stuff. So I just try to stay tuned in with the developer community. And I see that as a sort of parallel part of my career to the actual work of running a software company and developing stuff. So you worked for Apple and then you have your own company. What have you seen, especially looking at WWDC this year and then, you know, Johnny Ive leaving Apple? It's like we're kind of in another transistory phase. What have you seen as far as how Apple has changed over the last 20 or 30 years? Yeah, I mean, I guess it's sometimes been gradual and sometimes been sudden. And it is tough because one of the great things that Apple does is when they're at their best, the employees who work for them and for several years, as I did, come out of it with a sense of knowing what Apple is and how Apple would do something. And it's common to hear people say, well, that's just not Apple's style. <laughs> or, you know, and they've just proven us wrong on occasions. You know, there was a time when participating in, let alone founding, major open source initiatives would be something that you would never imagine Apple to do. And, you know, now we have WebKit, we have Swift, we have stuff that you would have never guessed Apple would do when I was first working for the company in 1995. And then, you know, you can add to that things like, well, Apple would never switch to an Intel CPU (laughs) until they do. And it's one of the things about the company is I think they're very conservative and measured and sometimes frustratingly stick with sort of like you can imagine them using the cliche, like if it ain't broke, don't fix it. And they do that sometimes to a painful fault, it seems, until suddenly they pull the rug out from under you and you have an all new architecture, all new operating system switching to OS X. They sometimes just, you know, say, here's a whole new language. Forget about, not, you know, not forget about Objective-C, but on a long enough time scale, forget about Objective-C. Right, right. It seems like they're also like not first releasers. As revolutionary as the iPhone is, it wasn't the first touch device, quote unquote, smartphone. And I mean that to their credit, they took a piece of garbage like Windows Mobile and threw it out the window and made something revolutionary like Apple Watch. They weren't the first ones with a smartwatch. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you're going to see that with the glasses, probably like they usually wait until a market is established before they put out a major piece of hardware. Yeah, I think the iPod was probably the canonical example of that because portable mp3 music playback devices not only existed they had become ubiquitous at right, the time yeah. the I iPod still have my came Sansa. out <laughs> yeah right then there were several well-known brands and many of us had at least owned one at the time the ipod came out and yet the proposition from apple was just basically hey Here's a really, really, really big MP3 player. (laughs) And somehow they just keyed into what the differentiation that made. At some point, it was like nobody really considered any of the competitors even that viable. The iPod was just what it was. And that's a great example of Apple being patient enough to really measure the market and figure out how they're going to enter it. Yeah, and I think it's a good lesson for a lot of folks like us who work on their own and come up with our own products. Like, it's not necessarily the best idea to be the first one out there. Right, yeah. There's a lot of risk you're taking on. So I found it interesting that before WWDC, like the biggest buzz amongst developers like us was Marzipan, Marzipan, Marzipan. And like afterwards, it seems like Marzipan slash Project Catalyst seems almost an afterthought compared to like the elephant in the room being Swift UI. What's kind of like your thought on Project Catalyst? Is it still an important piece in the Mac development story as far as being able to easily migrate your iPad app essentially to the Mac? Or is it like not going to go anywhere? You know, it's funny. I had another snap reaction to that during the keynote. And it was basically, I think I tweeted something like Apple has announced and deprecated a technology all in the space of one keynote, (laughs) which was basically like, hey, there's this brand new, exciting technology we have that you can adapt your iOS apps to the Mac and you should not use it. You should use this new Swift UI. And that's not what they said, literally. But 
So can you do a Mac app with Swift UI, but not necessarily Catalyst? Absolutely. Yeah. Swift UI is a native technology on, and that's just to clarify, that's the big promise of Swift UI is that it is a native technology on all Apple platforms. Okay. Yeah. So it's kind of funny. It means that there are two ways to write a Mac app with Swift UI. Right. Right. Because you could go the Project Catalyst route and have basically one bundle essentially that will work on both iOS and Mac OS, or you can just do a native Mac app and still use Swift UI. Right. Or more precisely, do a native Swift UI app and have it run on the Mac, on iOS, the watch, or the TV. Right, right. So for somebody, let's say, starting a new app or possibly somebody who has an existing iOS app, would you recommend somebody use Project Catalyst? Or what are some good use cases where that might be applicable? Yeah, I mean, I think it's exciting for people who have an iOS app and they've invested a lot of time, sometimes years of work into an iOS app. And for those occasional requests they get to have a Mac version of the app, I can easily imagine how it hasn't been compelling enough to go right from scratch an app, app kit based right. Mac app. So I think for those folks, it's compelling. I think it's just kind of like a probably a relatively narrow group of people who are really going to be compelled by that? I don't know. I could be wrong, but it seems like there's kind of like two groups of people who are going to be compelled by Catalyst. One is just kind of like the artisanal software developer who's made an iOS app and invested a lot of work in it, and now they have an easier opportunity to adapt that to the Mac. And then there's the sort of like, theoretically, the like cross-platform you know, the company that feels like they have to have their app on every single platform. And so this is the group of companies that are usually compelled to use things like... Electron. Electron, right. Yeah. I just don't know how compelling Catalyst is to them because it gets their iOS app onto the Mac, but it doesn't get it anywhere else. Right, exactly. Because you're not going to get your React Native team that's already like using Electron right. to like all of a sudden say, hey, let's use Catalyst. No, they're already using something else to build their cross-platform app anyways right. for Windows and Linux. Yeah, so long-term, I don't know, maybe the more compelling cross-platform pitch is if Swift UI ends up being adapted to non-Apple platforms. You know, and you could see that as being more of a quote-unquote threat to other platforms' ubiquity. If a company like Slack, for example knew that by investing in Swift UI exclusively, they could deploy to Windows, Linux, the Mac, iOS, and the web, then that might be pretty interesting. Right, right. I think it's definitely fair to say Marzipan slash Catalyst, it's fizzled. It is just, it was the most exciting thing in anticipation of WWDC. And then afterwards, some people are excited, but there was too much other stuff, too many other excitements to leave room. What other talks did you gather from WWC that you were like, that's really something people should take notice of? To be honest with you, I haven't watched that many talks yet. So that's okay. <laughs> I'm in the same boat. I mostly am just digesting what happened in the keynote, the State of the Union, and then occasionally things that people bring up that they learned from other sessions. And to be honest, nothing's popping to mind that's like, uh, I think most of the big stuff was summarized as part of the keynote and the State of the Union. So what do you think is like the compelling argument you'd want to make for somebody to build an app natively on the Mac as opposed to like using something like Electron? I mean, I'm such a Mac aficionado that I have to like look at that question from two points of view. One, trying to empathize with the pragmatism of these companies like Slack. Or is there another example we should <laughs> should we stop picking on Slack? But they're just no, kind of Slack a, a, is by far the biggest. Yeah. And there's that article they just released. Mm -hmm. I'll put in the show notes where they talked about basically rebuilding Slack, but still within the framework of Electron. Yeah. And I totally agree with you. The person who uses a Mac, that's a great example of an app that they should just use Catalyst. Because they already have a half decent iOS app, like might as well just migrate it over as opposed to Electron. Like I don't know how much of the optimizations they've done by the rebuilding and i'll post a link to that blog article i'm not an electron developer and i haven't done javascript in a while but it's like one of the biggest things i saw in that article is like
for the first time, we've decided that we should actually support multiple workspaces. And I was like, yeah, you know, that would be a good idea. Like I'm running like 10 different Slack workspaces. Right. Yeah. And they like, there's some other considerations that they made in, in rewriting it. And that's the me. I'm in the same boat, like the Apple developer who just wishes they'd write it native. But then, yeah, the pragmatist is like, there's a ton of people who run Android. There's a ton of people who run Windows. Yep. As a business, you can't just corner out a certain part of your audience just because no. you want it to look good and run great. And I think it's fair to say that Slack is not in the business of making exemplary platform apps, right? So their primary business is being available on all platforms and providing core functionality that specifically like helps mostly businesses get work done. And right. so like I can't judge them through the same lens as an app that has been thoughtfully and carefully crafted to really highlight the features of a specific platform. I don't know, this metaphor kind of came to mind as you were talking about that. It's hard to explain why nuances and details are important to somebody who has no investment in the nuances and the details, right? So this metaphor came to mind of like, I had two metaphors jump into my mind. One of them is, imagine you're like a poetry aficionado and you're talking to somebody and you say, wow, this Spanish translation of this poetry is really amazing. And somebody might say, well, why do you need that? You can just pump it into Google Translate and it will tell you exactly what it says, right? And so there's this like sense of like meeting the letter of the requirement versus being an actual artistically executed thing. Maybe another example is like, why make a movie when you could just go film a Broadway play? and sell that? You know, why go to the trouble of making a motion picture? Somebody who didn't appreciate the nuances and details of what makes a movie great versus a play might not be able to understand why anyone would bother. It would certainly be pragmatic to go just film, you know, The Lion King on stage Mm -hmm. and sell that. And like, even with movies, like there's a bit of both. Like there's the folks who are just really good at doing stuff on a shoestring and making something happen. And then there's the folks who are like, no, it absolutely has to be perfect and are willing to go into debt. And like, right. They don't care how much necessarily money they make, but they either want it because they want their voice heard or because they feel like this is a piece of art that I'll be remembered by. I actually think we might be onto something with this metaphor of the movie versus the stage as an example, because if you think about it, whatever the genre, the artists who are making the product, they know where it's going to end up, right? They know they're working for the stage or they know they're working for the screen. And that informs a lot of decisions about how they structure things and how they present the final product to the consumers. Now, I think that's really true about platforms whether you're developing for the web, for Windows, for Android, iOS, Mac, you have to know what you're deploying to in order to make these subtle decisions about how things are going to behave, how things are going to look. And anybody who says uh, cross-platform technology can achieve you know, all of the same things as each individual platform, I think is overlooking the fact that all of those little considerations won't be made. And just as, I think if you asked an average moviegoer, they wouldn't be able to put it into words why it would be bad to just go film, you know, the Broadway play. Right. But they would know in an instant that it was a piece of crap if they saw it on the screen. And I think there's something to that. I think a lot of users do get the sense that there's something wrong with software that feels like it wasn't designed for the platform they're using, even if they don't consciously sort of know it or they can't put it into words. So. I don't know. This is the conflict between, like I said, there's the pragmatism of sometimes just needing to be cross-platform at the lowest cost and lowest complexity versus really wanting to make sure that every user on every platform gets the feeling that you were catering to their platform. Going back to our earlier discussion, do you think Apple is a company that, like, it seems like they're more focused on the latter, where it's like they want to make the better experience, even they're priced that way, right? They're even priced more for the higher end. And I don't mean this in a derogatory way, but like Google, for instance, their stuff works pretty well, but it's not about the experience. And also like a lot of your companies like are more much more focused on the business. Yeah. And so their software is not 
perfectly smooth and, and works in every way. Whereas like, for instance, with Google, like Android, especially like you can do a lot with it. It's very open and configurable, right? Like that's kind of their whole thing. But at the same time, they're also the like 80% of the phone market. Because when I go to AT&T and Verizon, like they have the ones with the cheaper phones. So like, that's kind of, a, I guess, an example of that difference, perhaps. Yeah, absolutely. But you know, it's it's also just jumps to mind that at least in the U.S., I think the percentage of the market for like teenagers is something is like the inverse of that. It's something like eighty or ninety percent iOS. Oh, really? And yeah, it's something we'll have to look it up. Maybe cite that. But I remember learning that and just being like, wow, it's a great example of how you don't know when and how being quote unquote more tasteful in some way is going to have a powerful effect. And I don't know how many of those teenagers are going to stop using iOS as they grow up and maybe they didn't buy their first phone. Maybe they go to buy their first phone and they'll be like, wow, Android is a lot cheaper. (laughs) (laughs) But they also use their phones more, right? Like, I don't mean this in a bad way. Like, I think there's excellent Android phones, probably like your Samsung and your, your Pixel and stuff like that. But like most people who own Android phones are not big smartphone users like it's like this is the phone that they got with their bill when they signed up for whoever and they might use facebook and they might do texting but like and maybe email but that's like pretty much it they're not going to install apps on their phone they're not going to like really get into the nitty-gritty of setting up their phone they just want something very basic and that's it whereas like your iPhone user typically is like has plethora of apps installed for every store they go to, every messaging platform. And like, yeah. And I mean, it's just a good example that, well, I guess coming back to the basics, like this is all an argument of pragmatism versus like perfectionism. Not to say that Apple isn't pragmatic, they're very pragmatic, but they do allow themselves to indulge details that basically every other company decides to overlook and decides for pragmatic reasons not to bother with. And for many, many years, speaking, getting back to like how has Apple changed? I don't know if Apple has changed in this respect, but the world has changed to some extent because Apple has been proven correct in that assumption that if they focus on the details, it'll pay off. And it's kind of like for years, we Apple fans were just like, yeah, well, Windows is big, but you know, it's slightly worse than the Mac and we have that at least. And mm-hmm. over time, you know, it took like the iPod, the iMacs iPhone, iPads, all these things, but a lot of people have gradually come to appreciate that Apple's products are better. And at the end of the day, yeah, maybe 80% of the phone market is not, you know, swayed by that, but the massive profitability of the company proves that there is at least a way to have that attitude and to be successful. Yeah, I agree completely. And it seems like what they've done, like even with the Mac, it's like everything was a gray box from Gateway or like Dell, right? And then all of a sudden, people really like the sort of Johnny Ive design of these boxes. And all of a sudden, everybody's like kind of following that trend, like at least in appearances anyways, of having like notebooks that look thin and things like that. And it seems like they've actually led with it as opposed to, yeah, well, the notch. There's another great example, right? That like the industry follows, even though, like we've said, like, Macs and iPhones are not the majority of smartphones and computers out there. They seem to lead with it. And then like they charge the margins for it to make up for the fact that they don't have a majority of the audience. Right. So let's say you do decide you're going to build a Mac app today. What would you use? Would you use AppKit, UIKit, Catalyst, just totally Swift UI? If I was starting today, if you had asked me again, this is kind of the slow wear off from the keynote. If you'd asked me right after the keynote, I might even say, I'm going to stop working on my other apps and just start a new Swift UI app. (laughs) And it's definitely changed. However, what you alluded to earlier, the pragmatic choice Apple made to allow you to mix and match Swift UI with native, you know, I guess you'd say traditional frameworks from each platform. If I was starting from scratch today with a 10.15 Mac target, Mm -hmm. right, exactly. Here's the thing I would probably give it a go, trying to make it Swift UI as much as possible. And then I just don't know at this point because I didn't get in too deep with Swift UI. I don't know if that would, would play out or not. But I would give it a go and I would expect the app to eventually be substantially Swift UI based. And I think this came up on Twitter the other day. Somebody was asking about what to use. And my conclusion was we're just sort of in this uncomfortable transitional period right here where we're not really quite ready to say 
you just use Swift UI, but it's also something you probably shouldn't ignore in your thinking about how to plan an app. I almost want to say, like, since you could do just native Swift UI, you're totally fine just doing AppKit and then using like an NS hosting view, for instance, if you want to insert little pieces of Swift UI within your app structure, like you totally have that option available to you. Because like we said, just like UI kit works with Swift UI, you can do app kit working with Swift UI and get away with that. You'd be just as fine. And like I said, maybe not if it's released in the next six months if you're willing to take your time with it. Yeah. And especially deal with the challenges of Swift UI. I think like, yeah, it seems like, like you said, like Project Catalyst almost seems like a better fit if you already have an existing iOS app. Yes. But as far as like a brand new app, you may as well just stick with AppKit and Swift UI. I think that's right. It's not just AppKit, it's not just UI Kit. It's more generally whatever app code you're writing, if it can be expressed in Swift UI, then that's preferable because not only is it probably the future, but it also gets you that cross platform behavior that you're hoping for, you know, being able to This is a little bit of a risk. I've spent a long time already on this podcast saying it's kind of a fallacy that you can have these cross-platform frameworks that let you appreciate and and enhance the nuances of each platform. But I think it's a better chance of getting 99% of the way there with Swift UI because Apple is in charge of all the platforms. Swift UI is not a cross-platform framework that was written from the top to sort of adapt itself to every platform it supports. It's a framework that's being developed in tandem with the platforms it supports. So Apple is in a position to literally modify the frameworks of the system to better suit the Swift UI framework. And in fact, that's what they did. One of the things people were so curious about when they announced it was, is this going to be backwards compatible? Can we like backport a Swift UI app to 1014 or to iOS 12? Apple pretty quickly said no because it depends so heavily on on framework changes. Mm -hmm. So, but anyway, just to say, if you're starting a new Mac app, the question is no different than, in my opinion, than if you're starting a new iOS app or a new watch app or a new TV app. If you can do it in Swift UI, do it that way because, like I said, it's it's the future, but also because you'll get all those other platforms. You you know, you get ninety nine percent of the way there. I think the Finessing is where you're going to jump out to a native framework, but being able to share the sort of core functionality of an app between these different platforms is way better than just happening to have an iOS app that you can also deploy to the Mac. Yeah, I think it's a great way of putting it. Cool. So the other big elephant in the room with Mac development is kind of the locking down of apps and the whole sandboxing they seem to like go back and forth on kind of the iOSing of Mac OS. But one of the biggest ones is, is the security part. What do you think are some gotchas that people should be aware of if they're building an app for the Mac that might make it difficult, especially because of the security concerns and the locking down the sandboxing and things like that? Right. Well, the main schism is still between Mac App Store apps and quote unquote developer ID based apps. So at a really high level, that's just the distinction between whether your app is sold by Apple in their app store, or it's something that you as a developer distribute directly to customers. And the reason that's such a big division is because the Mac app store, as of about a year into the Mac app store, they no longer allowed non-sandboxed apps. So just from a high level, you're still allowed to develop and ship non-sandboxed apps on the Mac. It's just that they can't be shipped through the Mac App Store. Actually, a little caveat, unless you're grandfathered in. Right. So then you have to go through like notarization, which is like a, they're a, a kind of another process that they've created. It's been around for what, like a little over a year now? Yeah, I mean, so going back about seven years is about when Apple introduced the developer ID system and sandboxing and all this good stuff. And over time, they've been just sort of gradually ratcheting down what you can do by default on the Mac and the requirements for, you know, if you're a Mac App Store app and you comply with everything and you are in the sandbox and you use all the right entitlements and you get past app review, that's one thing. But then separately from that, if you are developer ID signed and you distribute directly 
Apple has one particular point of conflict with app developers, which is called Gatekeeper, which is the little bit of code in macOS that determines when you download and launch an app for the first time, determines whether the app is trustworthy enough to just open or whether it it will say to the user, you know, this doesn't seem trustworthy. Hey, I wanted to let you know that Empower App Show is looking for sponsors and patrons. Our audience is growing and we'd love to showcase you, your company, and your product on our show. If you want to be a patron, you can find us at patreon.com slash empowerapps.show. Or if you want to be a sponsor, reach out to me personally at leo at brightdigit.com. Your support is greatly appreciated and we look forward to showcasing your business and product on our show. Yeah, so like I got a new Mac about a month ago and then I pretty much ha- use Brew to install all my apps. So I have a complete list of all the apps that I have on there. I'll install a bunch of Mac apps using Homebrew and then you get that little warning whenever you try to run it saying, hey, you know, you have to go into security and privacy. You have to say open anyway. Is that what you're talking about? That is the gatekeeper feature, but I don't usually recommend going into those settings and changing that setting. You're talking about the setting that says, do you allow App Store apps or, you know, developers that are known to to Apple? It might be a peculiarity about the way you're doing it with Homebrew. I'm not sure. But generally speaking, folks who leave their system preferences at the default setting, it's a setting that says allow opening App Store apps and basically developer ID. Right, that's what I have. I have the default setting. And then every time you install from Homebrew, because it's technically not an identified developer. Right. So then you have to go in and say, go into security and privacy and it'll say like something like, do you want to allow Google Drive to be open? And then you say open. See what you mean. Yeah. 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 Yeah, so that's one aspect of the security getting ratcheted down. And I think it's one of the most interesting because it so deeply affects the first launch experience. That is the shifting security requirement that I think developers should be most attentive to and respond to as quickly as possible. Because if a user downloads your app and the first thing they see is the system saying this app looks fishy, right? that's really bad. (laughs) And you don't know the app, yeah, which is like most people. So like, for instance, if you don't do the App Store, but you do notarization, are you going to be okay? You'll be okay as far as getting the app launched. Apple still actually puts up a warning that says like, hey, I downloaded this from redsweater.com. Do you want to open it? Okay. But at least they give you the option. If you're not notarized and or you're not developer ID signed, then the warning you get in Catalina 1015 at least is very provocative. It says something like this app cannot be analyzed for malware or something like that. And it doesn't give you even an option to open it. Since the advent of Gatekeeper, there's this workaround, which is one of them is to go to the system preferences, like you described, and switch it to allow anything. But the other one is just to right-click and then select open from the contextual menu. And that is just sort of a weird little backdoor that Mm -hmm. when you do that, Apple puts up another panel that says, are you sure you want to do this? (laughs) And then you say, okay, open this. And then it lets you launch it. But that practically speaking, is not something any developer should count on users knowing how to do. So you get your app launched. That's one thing. The other thing that's been shifting over the years is sandboxing is this technology that you have to use for the Mac App Store, but you can use it for your direct shipped stuff. I happen to use sandboxing in most of my apps, and it just limits what you have access to on the system. And it by default limits you to, in an iOS style, to having storing your app's own files within a sort of locked down sandbox container that you by default can't get out of. But then separately from that, Apple has been increasingly adding these user facing security confirmations. Right. Beyond just simply like, oh, I'd like to access your microphone or your camera, like we're doing Skype right now, but also like, We need access to your documents folder. We need access to your downloads folder. Is that what you're talking about? That's it, yeah. So like the downloads and documents folder stuff, I think was new to Catalina. But before that, you know, 1014 introduced some new stuff. For example, like there's things that like like limit what default access you even have as a user to stuff in your home folder. But separately, people who do any kind of automation run into these warnings. Sometimes you don't even think you're doing quote unquote automation, but if an app for example, has as one of its features to open a song in iTunes, let's say, or in music on Catalina. Right. You might get a prompt now that says, 
something like Music Master wants to control iTunes. Yeah. Yeah. Or, well, you can't say iTunes. Music now. But <laughs> <laughs> it's funny, I actually updated one of my apps. It's a really niche little thing. It's called Flex Time, and it's a, kind of a, a programmable timer. And one of its age old features is sending the audio from what it generates to iTunes. And so I actually updated it for Catalina, and I had to go in and change all of it so that, you know, it calls it <laughs> iTunes on 1014, but it calls it music. And, it, you know, so I have some experience with that. But yeah, the thing is, from a security locking down point of view, there's two sort of facets to it. There's the aspect of Apple actually increasingly limiting outright what typical apps can do. And then there's the aspect of Apple just making it a nuisance to let the apps do the things that they can do by putting up all of these permission prompts. And sometimes the permission prompt, if you're thoughtless, you just say, oh, no, I don't want to let it do that. And then you've like inadvertently disabled this core functionality. You know, Now, let's say this Music Master app, maybe you downloaded it because you wanted to send things to iTunes. And now, forevermore, you can't really do it. And the UI and the experience of undoing decisions based on these little panels that come up has not been great. No, it has not been. I had experience with Mojave and AppleScript with a previous client. It was a pain in the neck. Like, like it's funny because in iOS, they bought the workflow team and they have shortcuts. And that seems like pretty popular amongst some folks. But like on the Mac, it's like the opposite experience. Like AppleScript has become like so janky to use, especially on Catalyst and Mojave, that the experience has not been great. And it's a pain in the butt to get an app active on that. So if you are developing an app for the Mac, assuming like you have to do sandboxing, yeah, do you recommend the Mac App Store or would you sell it on your own? Like, is it worth the sacrifice of the pay cut because of the marketing you might get from the Mac App Store or would you rather recommend, say, sell it yourself? And how would you make that decision, I guess? Yeah. Well, the 30% cut is painful no matter how you look at it. Some people are, forget about it. Who cares? It's just 30%. And I'm always like, but that 30% adds up to a lot of money if (laughs) you're doing any significant amount of sales. Right. And it frankly does not feel like, especially on the Mac, I'm sure iOS developers probably have their own opinions on this, but especially on the Mac where the Mac App Store has constantly lagged in functionality and in promotion, whatever iOS developers are not getting for their 30% cut, we are on the Mac not getting it even more. So it's annoying. It's frustrating to pay that 30%. Yeah. And it's a harder sell too, because well, iOS, we've already seen the challenges with that, like Netflix, for instance, Amazon, they kind of go around it their own way. But like on the Mac where you have for 30, 35 years of experience, just downloading stuff and installing it yourself on the Mac, whether by floppy disk or like on the internet, like the app store idea is not very native on the desktop. I mean, you could ask the windows store people that as well. Yeah. So like now on top of it, it's like, you're not really going to get that experience of people installing stuff through an app store on the desktop as you do on iOS. And then even on iOS, there are companies trying to find ways to get around it, like Netflix and Amazon. Yeah, so getting back to your original question, how to decide. So I decided as a longtime developer for the Mac to embrace both the Mac App Store and direct sales. But that was sort of easier for me because being around so long, of course, I was around before the Mac App Store. So anybody who was selling software before the Mac App Store had to have another solution in place for selling. Exactly. These days, when somebody comes to me and talks about getting started as a Mac developer, it's really hard for me to suggest anything but starting with the Mac App Store alone. Because on the one hand, it's become easier than it ever was before to sell stuff on the web. But on the other hand, it's still a bunch of junk you have to do that... You know, Apple does sort of earn their 30% in that respect. I think it's easier to begrudge Apple's 30% when we already have systems in place that handle a lot of the stuff that they provide. So just, you know, the fact that they can take money from people and then give you some of it is a pretty nice setup. And especially for people who are just trying to test the waters, why not? If you're testing the waters, I remember that feeling. It's like it's thrilling to get, let's say, $100 a month 
for something that you wrote and you publish. Yeah, it is really thrilling. It's thrilling. And, you know, it's not anywhere near a number that can sustain a career. But if you're just getting started, yeah, I would say write a Mac app, have some functionality you think people would be willing to pay a little bit of money for, put it on the Mac app store. And if you end up with a hit, I mean, the beauty of the Mac is you do have an alternative to start selling it directly if you think that's going to be a benefit. Maybe a year in, you say, wow, I made $100 a month for a year. I'm going to invest a little time on making a web store for this. Or, you know, maybe somebody comes to you and says, hey, uh, we want to buy a thousand copy site license. (laughs) And you're like, woohoo. And then you have the flexibility to adapt as things move forward. But it's really hard to argue with the Mac App Store as a first step if you're just getting into selling or distributing apps on the Mac. So like, let's say I'll just give you my example. Like I have a developer tool, Speculate, where I can build app icons and image sets out of SVG files. But unfortunately, like I need access to someone's code project folder in order to be able to export those images to the app icons and image sets. How could that app be utilized on the App Store even though like sandboxing becomes a real challenge because you need access to those folders. If I'm understanding you correctly, the folders are pretty well-defined. Yeah, so it'd be like your asset catalogs, right, in your Xcode project. So, I mean, the, the bottom line for most use cases with sandboxing apps, the kind of scenario you're describing, quote-unquote, all you have to do is get the user to... Save ones. Point at the assets that they're granting, yeah. So that could be either dragging in... For instance, if you were designing this with a sandbox in mind, you could have a user interface that says, drag in the project that you want to work with, and it could just be the whole project folder. And then that, by default, grants your app access to everything in that folder. That would probably be the user-friendly way to do it, is to have like one of these drag-and-drop wells. Right. But then separately from that, you have a choose folder button. And you know the way it works with sandboxing is it's intentionally designed that apps only have access to things that users have implicitly or overtly given access to. And then once you get that access, you save what's called a security scoped bookmark. Yeah, and then you have to like resolve the URL essentially. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's simultaneously like a real pain in the neck. And also... Once the user does it once, they don't have to do it again, right? So like exactly, every time yeah. you build your app, you basically can script it to build the app icons and image sets. Right. And I mean, it's really a pain for a different kind of scenario. For instance, if your app's customer you know, proposition was, we'll scan your whole computer for assets and present them to you. That's where you run afoul of sandboxing because... Yeah, I use Daisy Disk to track my disk space. Like, that's a great example where I run Catalina because I like to punish myself. But it has a hard time now with that, like, lockdown partition that they have. Yeah. It's like, I don't know what's in there. It's like, well, that's not super helpful for me. (laughs) Right. Those kinds of apps are definitely the most troubling for sandboxing. Similarly, I have an app, Fast Scripts, which is a script execution utility. And it's just like the whole point of this app is really to give automation folks unfettered access to running scripts that do whatever they want. And so, you know, that's an example where that's not a well-suited app for the sandbox. But in general, I would say over the years, as people have complained about the sandbox and the limitations it imposes, a lot of the limitations do have thought through alternatives you just have to sort of embrace them and so an example being like like we were discussing like okay so maybe the user has to actually point you at the files they want you to have access to and as you said it's just a one-time thing maybe it would be ideal if the app could say hey user i found your stuff isn't this nice but it's one of those things where you can appreciate how apple had to make a pragmatic choice about security versus convenience and you know especially as you mentioned i was on the talk show recently There was a lot of talk on that show about this non-consensual software idea. Yeah, I like that term, non-consensual software. So sometimes being non-consensual with a user can provide them with a very user-friendly experience, but that doesn't mean that it justifies the lack of consent. But how am I going to know how I'm going to look in 50 years if I don't share my photo of myself online? That's right. (laughs) There's no way to know. (laughs) Cool. As far as like software updating, outside of 
I know you've talked about this on Slack, but like outside of being able to update software in the Mac App Store, like you pretty much are dependent on something like Sparkle yep. to essentially let your users know that you have a new update to an app. And so there's like, yeah, there's a lot of other features that you are pretty much going to have to hand code or implement that the Mac App Store already provides. Yeah, that's one of them. Yeah. So have you developed any apps for iOS? It's funny. I have developed and shipped one very, very simple app that's been on the App Store since I think 2008. I know it's 2008 because that's the year my son was born, my first son. And it is a very simple app that just produces static noise and static visuals. It's called Swish. Oh, so it's like for sleeping. It's for sleeping or, you know, yeah, for anybody who like... White noise generator. White noise. And it basically tries to be kind of like the equivalent of turning a TV on with the static. And it down to the fact that it has like a static display like that, like an old-fashioned TV Oh, wow. Static. That's very cool. Yeah, it's actually one of the most impressive things about the app. It's a very simple thing, but that little static display was a little bit of cleverness that um, it's really, 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 really high performance because the only time I ever worked with OpenGL and I discovered like a custom shader trick I could use to generate that static noise. So it's kind of a fun little trick app. But apart from that, I have these like works in progress of adaptations of my blog editor, Mars Edit, and my crossword app, Black Ink, that are, I mean, I have to be honest, they're nowhere near shippable. And yet there's been a lot of work put into them over now, you know, past, or let's see, 11 years, I guess. So why would you suggest somebody build an app for the Mac as opposed to like iOS? Well, like I said, I'm a Mac aficionado. So it's kind of like getting back to that question of like, well, why would you make a play if there's already a movie? Well, because I love plays, let's say, is a fair answer to that. So there's two ways to answer that question. The answer that is because of loving the platform and wanting there to be great art, so to speak, for it. And there's the answer that is, you know, strictly related to whether it's profitable or not. And in the same way, you know, somebody might say, this seems like a really profitable movie, but it doesn't sound like it's going to be profitable on the stage. And somebody might say, well, I don't care because I want to see it on the stage. So maybe I'm torturing this metaphor, but I think there's something to the value of distinguishing between like, should you make this because it's profitable or should you make it because it's a great thing or ideally both, right? Just sticking with just like some of the baseline, is it practical? For many, many years, I explained why I haven't done more on iOS by basically summarizing it that iOS developers make $1 a sale and I make $40 a sale. Do you think that's changing at all? I don't, no. And I guess I don't study the iOS market that closely, but it still seems to me that it's really hard to charge a quote-unquote premium rate for an iOS app. I would almost say like it's not necessarily Apple's fault because it seems like they're really trying hard, not necessarily on the iPhone, but on the iPad to make it a competitor. I don't want to say competitor, but you understand what I mean. Like trying to make the iPad, especially the iPad Pro, a professional device for where I think like the Mac is really good is like the heavy duty work that video editors, speaking of making movies, people who code, folks who Mm -hmm. write, folks who do graphic design, 3D, AR, all that like really heavy duty stuff. The Mac really shines on and they're trying to do a lot more of that on the iPad, it seems. Yeah, I mean, I think Apple does deserve some blame going back to the launch of the App Store, in particular for ways in which they have made it more difficult to charge a high price and have customers actually feel emboldened to pay it. So, And it seems like the big money makers in the App Store, unfortunately, right now, is more like your, <laughs> your addictive app games where like they just kind of squeeze every in-app purchase they can to get you to play more. Right, exactly. So like some things that we whined about for years and we'll probably never see, like free trials, refunds. These are things that most people who charge a premium price for software have recognized that it's valuable to offer these things. And both of those things are only sort of possible through edge case you know, behavior on the app stores. You can get a refund if you know about being able to go complain to Apple and ask them for one. But, you know, for instance, developers can't say, 
try my software. And if you have any problem with it within 30 days, just click this button and get a free refund. Yeah, what I've seen is you pretty much like, for instance, I got double charge something that developer gave me another year for free because that's all they could really do for that. Right. And your only other choice would be to go to Apple directly and ask them to correct the problem. Right. So anyway, there's some blame to Apple, I think, for creating and then continuing to sort of foster this market that favors very low cost commitments and and or subscription based, you know, re-up commitments. And on the one hand, you can say well, that's Apple's fault. On the other hand, you could say it's developers fault for not adapting to that model. But, you know, at the end of the day, I think when you say like, the questions I was raising about like whether it's profitable to develop for the Mac, I think the same questions are more or less true for iOS. It's very tricky to make software that is profitable in the conventional sense. I almost encourage people who quote unquote have a great app idea is like your focus of making money should not be through the app necessarily. And a lot of apps have moved away from that and it should be from other services that you can charge outside of the app. Like the app should not be the focus of where your revenue is. And it's like you have a a business like that, for instance, you're a restaurant, like you have the app, the app is free and it's just a way to like get your audience, but it's not necessarily like you're not going to necessarily sell food off the app. It's just another more convenient way to get food outside of your main business. Right. And I think the conflict for people then is what if their main passion isn't making food, but it's making apps. You know what I mean? Like right. if what you want to do is make apps, you don't want to have to find a secondary way to make money off of it. You want to be able to say, here's my great app I made and I want you to pay me what's worth for me to keep working on it. You know, getting back to the tortured stage analogy, if you make the Lion King for the stage, you kind of want people to pay you the money to come see it. You don't want to have like Lion King on Broadway performances for free, but make it all up on selling plush animals, right? Right. I mean, you know, look at Google. Like, they pretty much make their money outside. Like, other than the phones that they sell, they make money off of advertising. I mean, yeah, I'm sure Google Apps for businesses uh, probably does decent, and the Pixel probably does decent, but vast majority of what they make is through advertising because a lot of their services are essentially free. Yeah, it's really hard. I was thinking, like, okay, uh, writing, for instance. You can have a really great writing app like Ulysses that or Mars Edit, for instance, for blogging and make money off of that. Like the only other thing I can think of is like you offer seminars for like how to do writing or, you know, you almost have to like figure out a way to provide another service. Yeah. Or like in the case of something like that, in that particular example, I've thought about, you know, for instance, should I be a full service blog hosting service. You know what I mean? Like that's something where you start to get into something that's more naturally suited to a recurring revenue type of setup. Yeah, that would be an interesting way to like make more money off of Mars Edit. It would. And so it's one of those examples where it's like, even if that would be practically a good way to pursue making more money, it's not my passion. So, yeah, okay. and when I think about it, I think, uh, do I want to run servers for a living? <laughs> You know, my co-host on my podcast, uh, Core Intuition, Manton Reese, he has made that decision. He's running servers for a living. He runs micro.blog. Right. That's what he wants to do. When I think about that, I have like a sweat panic about waking up and first of all, like, well, all my servers are down. (laughs) Second of all, oh, somebody has started using my servers to host illegal material or something. Yeah. Somebody has figured out a way to pay me $5 a month while costing me $100 a month in right. bandwidth and storage or whatever. You know, And I know, I know people who do this kind of stuff, hosting, they figure these things out, but it's not my passion to figure those things out. Yeah, there's a really good episode of Build Your Own SaaS with uh, Justin Jackson where he's talking about his podcast host and just dealing with bandwidth costs. You wouldn't think MP3 files take up a lot of space, but cumulatively, yeah, like, Having to distribute MP3 files to a large amount of people, it costs money after a while. And yeah, you got to kind of think of all that stuff too. Yeah. Cool. Speaking of Manta, Manta's going to be on the next episode and he'll talk about Look at that. micro.blog and developing for multiple platforms. So stay tuned for that next time. Before we go, we'll probably have an event in the fall. What would you hope out of Mac hardware in the next few months? Besides fixed keyboards. Well, yeah, that's the only thing that matters, though. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, No, I'm definitely on team keyboard problem. And 
I sort of combine in with that. I really want my escape key back. I do have a touch bar MacBook Pro and I am not as negative about the touch bar as some people, but you know, not having the escape key really bugs me. And it has been kind of just the MacBook Pro in its current form, it seems to me is so great in so many ways. It's actually kind of hard for me to think about things that it really needs. And so the glaring defect of the keyboard just yeah. takes away from that. Like what should be a product that you think, yeah, I got the best. You have this reminder all the time of I got the best computer with a bad keyboard. And that's just such a bummer. So I don't have a Mac keyboard with a touch bar. I actually have the, to- the last one they made before the touch bar. I had the same dilemma because I want to upgrade my hardware. I bought a new iMac. I was like, well, maybe I should buy a new MacBook Pro because my thing's probably not as fast as it could be. And I was just like, why? There could be a new ARM Mac maybe in the next year or so. There's going to be fixed keyboards. Like, why am I going to invest all this money in a new MacBook Pro? I ended up buying a two terabyte hard drive and then I just upgraded the hard drive because that was my biggest pain point was running out of disk space constantly. Mm. Yeah, I think it's a great time to wait on the MacBook Pro. Rumors are floating, as you probably know, about this 16 inch, I guess somebody's... What do you have? Somebody's rumoring. I have the 15 inch MacBook Pro right now. And like I said, it's great. You know, if I put my mind past the keyboard issues, which knock on wood have not been as bad for me as for some people... It's a great computer. It's silent most of the time. You know, it's cooler than my previous generation MacBook Pro. It's thinner. You know, I know a lot of people criticize Apple always just focusing on making it thinner, but it's kind of nice if they get everything else right. Little things like being able to plug the USB-C plug into either side of the Mac. I do have all these things I appreciate. You know, since you mentioned it, the prospect of ARM coming to the Mac, I think that's really interesting. I am a little bummed out of what we'll maybe lose with respect to being able to easily and with high performance do things like virtual machines for Linux and Windows. I mean, I guess you could have a Linux, uh, an ARM Linux, but... Well, don't they have Windows on ARM too? Or is that not the same thing? Yeah, I don't know. Um, <laughs> We're not I don't right know if that, that adapts. Yeah, <laughs> I guess I assumed that was like a lesser version of Windows or something, like a mobile version or something. But right, and I think you're right. Maybe when and if there are Mac, who knows what the future's bringing, maybe there'll be a motivation for Windows to have a full, if they don't already, to have a full like Windows 10. I basically don't use Windows that much, but I have to use it sometimes. I use it in a virtual machine. I'm in the same boat. So, yeah. Yeah. But, you know, I could see there being excitement to Apple having control over the whole platform in terms of the architecture Being able to focus entirely on ARM across all of their devices would have benefits, I think, for the platform and for its products that are similar to the benefits it's going to try to scope out by having Swift UI on the software level unite all of those platforms. Would you get a 16-inch or do you think you're going to stick with a 15 or what if you were going to get a new one? If the 16-inch was the way to get a new one with a better keyboard and an escape key, I'd be happy to do that. I'm not that concerned about the size. And from what what I understand, maybe the size isn't that different. It's more that they've just got gotten rid of some of the bezel okay. space. So I'm excited to see what they bring. And in general, just kind of summing up this feeling from the WWDC with respect to the Mac, one of my other big takeaways was nobody benefited more from WWDC this year than Mac developers, which is a very interesting scenario to be in. And I also think, like, going back to history of Apple, I think Ben Thompson kind of said this. It seems like we're transitioning away from the iPhone being God of Apple era. Like you said, Mac is definitely number one. And I'd say, well, nobody pays attention to the Apple TV. But, like, the Apple Watch, like, it seems like more and more development is going to the Mac as well as the Apple Watch and away from the iPhone. I don't know exactly what you mean when you say number one. I don't think the Mac is number one in terms of Apple's Product focus. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I mean, as far as developer focus, mm-hmm. this seems like they're trying to encourage more and more stuff on the Mac, as well as the Apple Watch and like the iPhone. Like, while it's definitely the biggest profit maker, it seems like it's matured pretty significantly. Yeah. Well, for example, like for years and years and years, I think there's been sort of like a low grade paranoia that the future of Apple platforms was going to be all iOS and that eventually we'd get like an iPad with Xcode and Apple would just be like, this is the year, get a keyboard for your iPad if you want to develop. (laughs) Yeah, that's true. And it really, really seems clear from 
this year's announcements in particular, Apple would not put this much effort into a platform that they were planning on deprecating anytime soon. And so in a real optimistic way of taking, you know, the changes with Swift UI and everything, the fact, as I said, that I think Mac developers benefit more than anybody else from this year's announcements, I can imagine Apple internally being in the situation where they're like, dang it, like we love the Mac, right. yet we have this problem that we can't really give it all the attention it deserves because of X, Y, and Z. And if you interpret their announcements this year as being sort of like a clever way of addressing X, Y, and Z so that it does incorporate the Mac, then it's a really good cause for being optimistic, I think, about the future of the Mac. And I think something to consider for developers, just closing out the discussion, is the fact that like, I think in the same way we talked about Android and iOS and how more casual folks use Android and more dedicated phone users, so to speak, use the iPhone. I would say like you might look at the Mac as an opportunity and especially the App Store as an opportunity because people who use Macs really use their computers much more intently and quite frankly are probably more willing to spend money on software than your typical iPhone user would. Would you agree with that? I would agree with that, and not only that, but more likely that to spend money on software than a Windows user would, and definitely more likely than a Linux user. Would, right? <laughs> but it's a, yeah, we're in a scenario here where I feel frustrated by it as a Mac developer who isn't exactly hitting it out of the park profit wise. I feel a little frustrated, and for that reason, I can't really be an authority on this. But I have a sense that there is money to be made on the Mac. You just have to really be honest with yourself about what customers need and what they're willing to pay for. And you get some great examples like the huge success of Sketch on the Mac. And then also other uh, you know, apps like Pixelmate or these folks have identified huge numbers of Mac users who are willing to pay good money. And dissatisfied with Adobe Creative Cloud. <laughs> True. It helps if you can find a disgruntled group. <laughs> But there's other software out there on the Mac that's, you know, doing well and has a large paying customer base. And like in finding a market that uses Macs, like you said, like graphic design is a great example of of a market that uses the Mac pretty well and knows it and has been using Macs for, like you said, 30, 40 years now. Right. Or like, you know, you mentioned Daisy Disk earlier. I think Daisy Disk comes to mind often for me as an example of an app that has essentially identified something that virtually every Mac user is going to eventually need. And it's such a great example of that. And I imagine they're doing very well, especially for such a quote unquote simple app. But anyway, yeah, I do think what I said earlier about like at the core, I get $40 per sale where an iOS developer gets one or $2 a sale is a pretty heavy advantage. You know, being able to say, you know, your price is $40, $50, without cracking a smile and laughing, right? If you if you tried to price your iOS software like that, it would just be considered like comical in most contexts. But that helps a lot that when you get one customer, you can make $40 or 70% of $40. That's a huge deal. And that is something where if you can orient your thinking as a prospective Mac developer around that, like maybe you set your price at $100 and you say, what group of people out there would be willing to pay $100 a pop for something. And then you end up with answers like, um, you know, like ScreenFlow for screencast making or like Coda for web, you know, editing. Coda recently renamed to Nova from Panic. But anyway, I think it's a challenge. Obviously, like I said, I'm not an authority. I'm still working on it. And hopefully, you know, hopefully a year or two from now, I'll be more of an authority on it. (laughs) Well, I will be more than happy to have you on again to hear about what you've learned in that span of time. Sounds good. Hopefully I can bring some good news back. Daniel, where can people find you on the web? Easiest way to find me is my company, Red Sweater, is red-sweater.com. And then probably a good place to check me out is my main blog is bitsplitting.org, B-I-T-S-P-L-I-T-T-I-N-G.org. That has pointers to all my other stuff. If you're looking for something else to listen to, I mentioned it earlier, but I do a a podcast with my friend Manton Reese called Core Intuition, and that's at coreint.org. Yeah, definitely you should check out Core Intuition out. It is a great podcast if you're interested in the business of building Mac and iOS software. 
like I said, we'll have Manton on on our next episode to talk about the making of microblog and how that's worked out and building for different Apple platforms. You can find me on the web at Leo G. Dion or my company at Bright Digit. And we're also on Instagram and Facebook as well, all under Bright Digit. Daniel, thank you so much for coming on the show. It's been fantastic. Thanks so much for having me. It's been really fun talking to you.